Thank you so much, Brother Eric. Um, I'm sorry, my screen isn't clearer. Uh, it's, I don't know what's going on, and I hope there's nothing important going on on this end technically. But uh, you can see me okay, I assume, right? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you, and we already feel enlightened and uh, elevated. <laughs> Well, I feel so elevated, almost as though I'm staring at my own um, angelic form in in some very far away place because I'm getting a haze. Anyway, welcome everyone. Welcome Tanya. Welcome everybody. Anyone new here? Uh, anyone who's a regular here? I'm very excited to see tonight's guest again. I haven't seen her since before COVID. And uh, I will tell you that Tanya is the sister of Judy. We announced that last week, Judy Rich, who was here last week. And as you know, Judy is a yoga and fitness person and always talks about movement. And Tanya, I learned actually from the bio, uh, has been a professional dancer for 20 years. And most recently, uh, she's been studying and teaching Rod Drill, but most recently, she's a certified Pilates instructor. So we do have two sisters, and I will tell you that uh, I'm going to rat Judy out and tell you that she told us you're the older sister. And the reason she said that was that she was just emulating everything you did. And lucky for all of us, that included um, both of you being uh, here with us tonight and students of Raja Yoga and beautiful, beautiful dancers. I've had the pleasure of seeing both of them at Peace Village. Um, so the theme tonight is yogic silence. It's been the theme the entire week and we've had uh, five. We will have next week Sister Gayatri speaking as our last speaker on this theme, but we've had four uh, speakers and the three you've heard already, um, the first one was Sister Tina talking about uh, healing and focusing really on the transformation, which is our, that we can accomplish when we uh, realize that we can receive help from a power, from a power that we have within us that we draw from God or whom we call around here, Baba. And uh, that was very exciting. And then we had Sister Rini, who came to us all the way from California via Zoom. And she was talking about the silence being synonymous with self-awareness, that they're synonyms, and how much uh, we've all heard these beautiful, beautiful students of Raja Yoga talk about the transformative effect of silence and maybe we needed to transform our definition and of course sister judy last week was talking about getting the point and if you remember her point was that no matter what's going on in the outside world we are responsible for and have complete we aim for complete control over our inner state and we watched i have to tell you there are beautiful videos that sister gayatri has provided all month of uh, Judy doing 21 postures, one for every day of June. It just ended on the first day of summer. And uh, the postures expressing the transition that I do believe Sister Tanya is going to talk about tonight. And she's going to talk about how we combine body and soul. And if you were able to watch the videos of her sister doing this one at a time, postures you may know if you study um, Hatha Yoga, but bringing that Hatha Yoga posture into the soul food that we need to combine them. So silence doesn't have very much to do with silence, I've learned here. Silence has a lot to do with taking full control over the thoughts in our minds and how we can uh, embellish whatever we're doing with the body by raising our consciousness. So I'm not gonna say any more. I uh, am so looking forward to what Tanya has to say this evening. Um, Tanya's had a lifelong fascination with movement and 
Um, I'm very, very curious to see what you're going to bring to us this evening. So without further ado, welcome to Harmony House. And thank you for coming all the way from Montreal. Right? Montreal, is that right? That's correct. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, Montreal. And uh, thank you so much for having me with you this evening. Thank you, Louise, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, really happy to be joining this series, actually. At first, when I heard about the title, you know, it sounded very almost quantum physics-like. <laughs> and I was a bit concerned if I was up to the task. But, you know, the more I thought about it you know, and sort of broke it down, I guess you could say, the more I realized that um, it is exactly what uh, certainly the practice of Raj Yoga is aiming to uh, emerge in terms of a capacity to transform through silence, through inner silence. Absolutely. And uh, Sister Tina, before you continue, I did forget to invite everyone, as I told you I would. That's um, right. And I forgot yeah. to. <laughs> Tanya has asked that you write anything you want to say, any comments, any questions in chat. And we'll probably address those at the end of the uh, 40 minutes or 30 minutes or so towards the end of the session. Uh, so please, she would love you to participate. Okay. Certainly your comments and questions will be most welcome. So I've come to uh, a spiritual practice and specifically to the practice of Raj Yoga from um, a very much a movement background. So first as a dancer, I mean, I did athletics in school then as a dancer, which really consumed my life for yeah, around almost 20 years. And, and then as a Pilates instructor, and around the same time that I became a Pilates instructor, I also began my practice of Raj Yoga meditation. And the two I feel have been moving together. And in terms of what silence and yogic silence might have to do, I think it's very maybe more clear when we talk about the soul or the spiritual being, but what that silence might have to do with the body may not be as clear. Um, silence, of course, is not this empty void. And the fact that it's very specifically called yogic silence in the uh, that title, you know, specifies that, that this is a silence coming from a connection or reconnection to that spirituality, spiritual identity, spiritual personality, nature, and spiritual reality more than anything. And with that, within that spiritual reality to that spiritual dimension, to bring that back into our lives, something that um, certainly was absent in my life or, or at least in a very overt sense um, for very many, many years. Uh, for a good part of my adult life. But the lack of it became more and more evident as I moved along in my life. So back again to the silence. Um, as a dancer, I was a very um, athletic dancer. I mean, I could do very lyrical things too, more balletic things, but I was more of a, a very athletic, dynamic dancer. And yet what allows one to become proficient in actually any art, but certainly one that involves the body, one needs to develop a state of inner calm and balance. So there were many times when I look back, of course, from the perspective of a spiritual practice, of having once again reconnected to that spiritual reality and having, you know, um, experienced that inner silence through that practice. When I look back at my physical experiences through dance, I start to see where, in fact, I was cultivating that silence. And, you know, one experience in particular I recall was I would be in class and it would be towards the end of class. We're now doing the big choreography 
And often we'd be in, split into two groups and alternating one group goes in the other. And then usually at the end, so it's gone back and forth a few times, uh, we'd been invited to do it all together. So you can imagine if you're in the second group, that means you're now gonna do it two times in a row. And this is after a full hour, this is at the end of an hour and a half class. So needless to say, you're probably exhausted. And then sometimes the teacher would be very enthusiastic and say, let's do it one more time all together. So now it's three times. And I remember one time in particular, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I couldn't imagine where this energy was going to come from to do it a third time. Very intuitively, it's like I redirected my awareness to really the center of my forehead, to a place, a spot, you could say almost in the very heart of my consciousness with the idea that this was somehow gonna allow me to kind of pull up this energy. And in fact, that's what happened. As I powerfully just, it was like almost by survival, just intuitively to survive, I redirected my attention there. And I could feel my power, my internal energy building up. And of course it was the energy of the soul. I didn't know anything about the soul at that point but I am a soul. And I think as a performer, you're almost tapping into this so that you can go beyond the limitations of the body. Now, that doesn't always mean you do that in a good way. And in fact, that was also part of my journey. Um, so just to finish that last story, in fact, when the, the instructor counted us in to do it the third time, I had so much energy, more energy even than you know, before I did it the first time. So that I found very interesting. I thought, what was that about? <laughs> but I was happy it worked. So, you know, we've always been souls and there's been this intuitive ability or understanding, you know, even when there was extreme pressure, my go-to would be to sort of pull into that still point, you could say the eye of the storm, that would be almost a very natural response. And to the point where people thought I was so calm under pressure. Of course, they had no idea that in my head there was a tornado <laughs> because I would sort of pull into this, this calm, but I didn't know what to do with it. You know, so I'd be in this calm, but I, could, I was still feeling the pressure because I didn't know how to now turn that power into choices, into, into action. You know, that would come later with a spiritual practice and more understanding. Um, but, you know, this again, um, I, I ended that with talking about that, you know, when the soul and when that will and that internal power of the soul um, is used to go beyond the limitations of the body, that can happen in a good way, as it did in that experience I shared. But it can also happen in, you know, if ego is driving it, for example, which it did, and attachment, my whole life revolved around dance. And I got injured, but I couldn't stop dancing because I needed to, you know, it was really, I was a dance addict. Uh, you know, I, I um, very openly admit I was a, a, a dance addict and I needed it to live. And um, I pushed my body and was very fortunate I didn't push it to the point of permanent damage. But when you don't have you know, access to spiritual understanding. Yes, you may access the natural silence that's in the soul, because I am a soul always, even if I forget. Um, if you don't have full knowledge, then it doesn't lead to transformation, it can lead to damage, and you get trapped. Uh, you, you don't understand this power you have, you don't know how to use it properly. So, you know, these were some of the experiences I was having of, you know, going on beyond the limitation of the, the body by somehow intuitively accessing that spiritual power. Later on, and this wasn't actually in my bio, but I had a brief stint in towards the end of um, my time as a performer when I'd actually started to receive spiritual knowledge. So at this point, I knew I was a soul, 
but wasn't really doing much about it. I just thought it was a great thing that I'm a soul. It's fantastic. I was sure that there was, this was the key to turning, to making change in my life. But I hadn't reached that point where I was actually willing to put in the time and the practice necessary to turn that into reality. But at that time, I took up scuba diving. So another opportunity to once again, put myself into, if you will, a situation that somehow the soul became very present. Because in scuba diving, one of the things that you have to do to go down into the depths of the ocean, it kind of sounds like I'm going to be giving you a little meditation commentary, but to go down into the depths of the ocean from the surface, you need to become heavier. I mean, that's obvious. So you're wearing this flotation vest that you've inflated so that you'll stay at the surface without any effort. But now I want to go down. So I start to take the air out of my flotation vest, but I'm wearing a wetsuit. And the wetsuit has millions, maybe more billions, I don't know, of little tiny air bubbles because it's this kind of fabric. So you can actually float just with the wetsuit. So they put weights on you to help you go down. But still, I have another source of air. And where is that source of air? In my lungs. So my, air, my lungs become a balloon that's also keeping me at the surface. So a scuba diver will develop this technique where they need to become very still and very gently release the air as much as they can out of their lungs and just breathe enough, obviously, to not pass out because that won't be very helpful when you're scuba diving so that you start to descend. And there's this sort of pride, if you will, and I think it's sort of a pure pride. It's not too much ego really because it's all good fun, but that as you progress, as you become more experienced, more advanced, you wanna wear less and less weight and be able to control your descent by having that complete control over the body that you, because when I first, my first dive going down, I was so nervous. So, you know, you're almost hyperventilating, which makes it very difficult to release the air from your lungs and go into that stillness. So of course, looking back, when I began my spiritual practice, I realized that was another aspect that was helping me to be able to access that silence, that state of silence in which there is power. And so this was, you know, the power to control my body, to control myself and be able to go down easily and, you know, very lightly with that lightness and uh, feeling of control. And then of course you're using your breath um, and the vest to control your um, depth because you can very easily drop down and have no idea and then you're kind of in trouble. So, you know, there's all these aspects um, that I was quite of very um, unconsciously exploring that then became very useful to me when finally I realized, you know, I need to be able to have more control over my inner world. I do not, you know, even with the practice of dance, it was within a very specific set of circumstances, I often used to joke, the moment I step on a stage, I'm a master. <laughs> the moment I step off, you know, I bang into a wall or something. <laughs> I was kind of accident prone. <laughs> so, you know, I was very much recognizing how easily influenced I was, how I could be a master within the very specific context of dance or anything actually that involved the, bo involved the body because of, I think, um, there was a lot of joy in using my body. And joy, in fact, um, is very important in a practice. It's very heavy and uh, there isn't that joy. There's just, just this sense of sort of forcing the self. There isn't that lightness. And especially in a spiritual practice, because what I'm doing, you know, with the body, I need to have lightness, but I'm dealing with something that has weight, that I'm using muscles, that, you know, it's, it's very gross in a cert, at a certain level. We develop refinement as we become more experienced, but we're talking about developing a practice where the muscles I'm using are subtle. It's the soul. 
And so if I, I don't have that refinement, um, how am I going to be able to, uh, to really advance? And, you know, it's something that um, has deeply impacted my spiritual or my physical, sorry, practice, what I have learned to do on a spiritual level. And, you know, that, that joy helps to maintain that lightness because I will need discipline. I will need focus. I will need to develop the, con the capacity to concentrate. And all of it, so I can position myself in that fundamental state of silence, inner silence, in which very naturally these capacities, it's almost like, you know, I get into the silence and suddenly all these spiritual abilities emerge, these powers, these qualities become available. I mean, I can do it now in a second. That was not what happened in the beginning. <laughs> I'd sit there wondering, what am I doing? Because of course, I'm doing something where I can't look in a mirror and check <laughs> to see if it's correct. Um, I will kind of, uh, what's the word? Um, confess that I often didn't find a lot of the commentaries I was listening to very helpful um, because uh, maybe because of how I trained as a dancer, you're used to kind of drilling things and having a very step-by-step -step approach where you're learning a complex movement, but you break it down and you learn this, and then you add this, and then you add this. Whereas often the commentaries were like, you know, you go to the ocean and you're looking at the waves and the lights shining on you. And, you know, it, it just seemed like I was going to watch a film to try to get into that state of silence rather than developing a practice where I would be able to step by step, take myself there to the point where, you know, for example, there's a step in dance called a pirouette. And some of you may be familiar with that, where the dancer is up on their toes on one leg, on one foot, with the other knee bent and the foot against, fixed against their leg, and they spin around. So it's called a pirouette. Now, when I was very young, I learned this movement, and it starts with you with both feet, because you've got to learn to whip your head, turning with your feet, doing little tiny steps, turning around in a circle while you try and keep your head facing the front as long as possible while you're turning, and then you whip it around so that as you continue turning, you lose your focus on the front for almost not any time at all. So you learn that first. Then you learn just balancing on one foot, not turning. Then you do a quarter turn, then you do a half a turn. Then you've got to learn where your arms go. So you learn that separately. But once you've drilled them all, it's not like every time I would go to do a pirouette, I'd have to think head, feet, arms. They would all automatically come into play in a second. I wouldn't even have to think about it. I had drilled them. My arms wouldn't go, you know, one place, one time, somewhere else, the other time, but to the same place. And so for me, I felt, well, won't my spiritual practice have to be like this? So that it'll become consistent. And so I, I feel it's very helpful sometimes, um, you know, if you do have a physical practice, because we're more likely to do drilling in that, to help that to understand that that's very useful, that kind of discipline and carrying it over into a spiritual practice. That when I sit, I step by step take myself into that state of silence where then that peace, that lightness, that feeling of freedom, of being unlimited, naturally emerge every single time. Otherwise, now I'm just doing that seated. Otherwise, the moment there's any kind of challenge, and that can be just someone comes and talks to you, or even nobody comes to talk to you, you just start to think about your day. Yeah, you just start to think. That's activity. The moment any other kind of activity comes into play, I lose it. 
because I've been relying on a bunch of thoughts that don't, you know, that are kind of arbitrary, you know? I'm kind of thinking about this or that or some nice, it's almost like I'm taking going into nature to have that silence and I'm just internalizing it with my own thinking. So that's just my own kind of um, sharing, if you will, that I found it very, very helpful that it be something more systematic so that it can be repeated and it can be drilled and it can become natural and automatic. It become a reflex, a habit. So um, I was very, very thankful for my discipline of dance and the physical, you know, even Pilates, which is what I teach now. Um, what's very interesting about Pilates is that there's actually principles that go with Pilates that are quite spiritual. The first guiding principle of Pilates is concentration. And I would suggest that the first thing I need to learn in a spiritual practice is how to concentrate my awareness, how to bring it, position it, and maintain it. Ultimately, the center of the forehead on myself. And of course, it's not the center of the forehead, like I want to feel my forehead and I want to center myself there. That's just kind of like, you know, giving me a place that I need to direct my attention. But where I'm actually taking my, my awareness or my consciousness, uh, it's interesting. I want to go into my consciousness with my consciousness. <laughs> it's this interesting aspect of, of spirituality is the soul is conscious energy but it's also generating conscious energy. So it's kind of like the sun is this fiery ball and it's generating heat. So I am both, I'm consciousness and I radiate consciousness, conscious energy. And that conscious energy animates my body, which is a whole other <laughs> interesting relationship that I'll, I'll elaborate on in a moment. But I wanna develop that capacity to concentrate my awareness. And so even in a physical practice, I need to do that because even though, yes, I'm using the body, who's using the body, the soul. So in fact, any physical practice is spiritual. Ultimately, <laughs> we call it being a karma yogi, meaning I maintain that yogic state, that yogic silence, that concentrated, positioned if you will, self. And it's funny because the soul is silent. The soul isn't noisy. The soul can make noise to its body, <laughs> either through its mouth or banging on an instrument or with an instrument or whatever. But the soul is silence. It's its nature. And the soul is still. The soul's not, you know, running around. It's still. It's just there all the time. The body moves. So when I tap into what I am, in fact, that's what my spiritual practice is inviting me to do. When I tap into what is my intrinsic nature, beingness, I access that silence, that stillness, that give me a feeling of being rooted, of stability, and of, of power. That is very, if you will, calming, reassuring that creates that fundamental state of peace. You know, even there can be chaos going on, even in my own head, I can see there's these thoughts swirling around. But if my practice has been to become capable of almost effortlessly positioning myself, that is gonna help me when what we call sometimes those storms come up. So, just continuing on now with, you know, this relationship now of the body and the soul and how I'm suggesting that using the body as a spiritual activity, because the driver is the soul. It's a spiritual being that's making everything happen. But it's not a given that it will be spiritual, if you will, what is expressed. <laughs> and we know that because the soul can do very unfortunate things through the body very harmful things. And spirituality, I think we intuitively know means good things, benevolent things. We equate spirituality with goodness, 
with being, uh, you know, in a state of, of benevolence, not harmful. So it's clearly the, if you will, how the soul is oriented that is really important. And of course, the first step in that is just to know I'm a spiritual being. It's to pull myself back into truth again, which is, if, if you will, my spiritual alignment that changes the quality of the energy I'm generating and the quality of activity I then perform. So the body can then become an ally in the expression of my spirituality, in the practice of my spirituality. Because I think the body became the enemy because we had no idea there's this soul. All we saw was this craziness sometimes coming out of us <laughs> and the body often being the instrument, you know, out of the mouth or, you know, through, through our, our, what we were doing, our activity. Um, a lot of violence, in fact. And so we felt the body's the enemy, you know, and that turned into very unfortunate practices that were also violent in terms of trying to control the body rather than address the real issue is that the driver, in fact, it's not the car, but the driver had some problems, was not properly aligned. The body, if I want to increase the functionality of the body very in a very simple way, well, it's not maybe so simple, but efficient way, I look at the alignment. I mean, I can change a person's experience in one Pilates session just by either through props, you know, getting them out of gravity, whatever, change their experience of, you know, what's happening in their body, you know, could be pain, could be dysfunction, you know, limited mobility, whatever it is, just even in one session, it can happen. Not always, because sometimes the problem is so severe in the body that it's going to take a little bit of time. But ultimately, the soul is king. The soul is actually having a huge impact on the state of the body. And often because the quality of the energy generated by a soul that is not in their truth is having such a detrimental, detrimental impact on the body. One of the first things, creating tension. Sometimes we refer to it as being body conscious, not having the awareness of the soul, not having connection to my spirituality. I do everything, even if it's subtly, with tension. Because behind it, there's attachment, there's desires, there's expectation, there can be fear, there can be anger, all of these emotions, tension. There can be even pain, tension, all of these things. So when that soul starts to center in its truth, one of the things it begins to do is let go, let go. And in fact, in that letting go, capacities emerge. If, if I can get a client to release tension from their body, their capacity skyrockets in terms of physical movement. And sometimes they think it's magic. <laughs> it's like, no, not magic. Line alignment. And often we can call it breath. Because guess where we hold a lot of that tension? Most of us think our shoulders but we have no idea the amount of tension we're holding in our ribs. It's like we're stifling ourselves, stifling our body almost all the time. And one of the things we can experience when we sit in meditation and the soul becomes so powerfully centered and aligned and naturally releases, and we feel that lightness internally, is we st it starts to become transmitted to the body because the soul is animating this body. If I then proactively share, if you will, radiate that energy to my body just by focusing my awareness, sending it as a soul in that awareness, which we'll do in a little meditation experience, um, it's amazing how I can really help my body so, so much. And this is often what I need to do with clients where it's so extreme, the tension. It's like they've turned their body into cement. It's so extreme that I need to speak to the soul. I need to get the soul on board 
And, you know, maybe I can't talk about spirituality. I can talk about the driver. I can talk about consciousness. I can talk about concentrating their attention up in the center of the forehead. Even doing that allows them to access that silence, that stillness, that letting go. And it's so powerful. And it's absolutely transformative. So I, first of all, change, transform the relationship with myself. Then I can transform the relationship with my body just by being the soul now, fully awake and aware, in the driver's seat, directing the activity with that lightness, with that powerful lightness, that powerful peace, that stability that comes from being connected to my innate silence and stillness. And through that, all those other qualities and those powers. And I need to drill it. I need to drill it so that, you know, I often share that in dance, um, I don't know, maybe I can zoom out here a little bit and just show you something um, because it's uh, just a very good example of, um, okay, so woo, now you can see my little light there. I'm showing off my trade secrets. Yeah, anyway, so, one of the things you learn is something called third position. I don't know if you can see my arms. No, you can't. So you'll just have to see my uh, light there for a moment. Oops, I'm going in. Okay, let's go back out. So third position is, this is first position, third position. So I've drilled that so many times that I just third position, third position third position. It will always go to the same place. Other side, third position, same place. I don't even need to think about it anymore. I don't need to put first and then move my arm. I haven't danced mm, probably in about 20 years now. I will still be able to do third, whoops, do third position. I'm going far away from you all. Coming back now. So this is the power of drilling so that it becomes something that you don't have to try to figure out when you're in a situation that is creating pressure and stress. You, you can at that time. Yeah, you will fall back on, and I've experienced this, you know, where I was in a situation where I was, um, I was actually invited to cater with a friend of mine who was also uh, a Raj Yogi. And uh, we were going to cater an event. And so um, he actually had to go teach a, a Hatha yoga class during it. And he said, will that be okay? And I said, yeah, I think we'll have enough time. Sure, go ahead. And so I'm at his apartment. I'm busy doing something. And I start to do some math. And I realize, oh, my gosh, we'll never have enough time. We'll never get this done in time. What were we thinking? Why did I tell him to go? You know, and the, you know, that uh, whirlpool thinking starts happening. The whirlpool is about to suck me down into an ocean of emotion. And immediately it was like this little, I don't even think it was a voice, but what happened internally was no. And it was like my practice just put me there. I didn't think about it. I didn't even think I'm a soul. It's just, that's where I went. Almost like a, a paramedic firefighter. Yeah, it's drill. You just do it. And that's what I did. And it was amazing. This phrase came into my mind. There will be just enough time. And it just kept sort of coming back. There'll be just enough time. And part of me was like, really? It's like, okay. I started it was like I knew what to do, when to do, how to do. I got faster, more efficient. My friend comes back. He's in another room working on some other um, uh, food item that we're preparing. And suddenly he calls me in. He says, Tanya, we'll never make it. We're never going to have enough time. And I look at him. I just say, we will have just enough time. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and a few minutes later, he says, I'm getting faster. I'm getting faster. Then there comes a point where, and I had asked him before, do you need me to bring any pans or anything? He said, no, no, I have everything. We're making stuffed zucchinis. We've got 80 halves of stuffed zucchinis that we need to now bake. And, he's, and I said, where's your pans? He shows me this pan that's like this. 
this big, like, I don't know, eight by 10. And I got you kidding. <laughs> and immediately he's like, do you have tin foil? Put it on the racks in the oven. Just throw them on the racks on the tin foil. The guy came to pick up the food right when we finished. And at that moment, I haven't eaten anything all day. I've just been doing this all day. And I now have to go to work. I have to still go home, which is about 15 minutes away by car. I've got a car. I've got to go home, get changed, grab some food. And then I'm going off to work in rush hour traffic. And I am leaving now from home after the time I would normally leave to get there. Now, what would you think? I'll never make it. There's not enough time. But it was still going. And I'm like, oh, let's just see. I'll be just... <laughs> It was, it, it was almost like I, I don't know, I, I slowed down time. I, I, bent, I bent time. I don't know how it happened. But literally, I walked in the door, kind of yelling out instructions right at six o'clock when the class started. It was a miracle, you know. And, but more than anything, even if I hadn't made it, I was so calm. I was so okay. Because me showing up a mess would have been absolutely useless for them, for the clients, for the students. So, you know, all of these things to say, drill, practice, uh, that concentration. And then through that, uh, you know, I'll just touch briefly, we can then have that second connection, the real yoga, where we tap into that space of silence, that dimension of spiritual silence, of yogic silence and connection to the Supreme Soul. And it's that connection that I desperately need because I've accumulated a lot of stuff. As a dancer, I could learn all sorts of things of how to move my body better. But if I don't deal with the scar tissue or the in things left by the past wrong actions, and by that, I'm going to need some outside help. If I don't get that, the body's only going to be able to go so far. As a soul, I can only go so far with positioning myself in my truth, my true alignment as a spiritual being. I need that pure energy to address what's accumulated in the soul, the spiritual injuries, if you will, that will take me out of that silence again and again. So this is the yoga that is essential, first within and then beyond. Yeah. I want to jump in here, if that's Please okay, do. before we, I, I don't know where the last 20 minutes went. Last time I looked at the clock, it was 20 <laughs> minutes ago. Um, this is just amazing. Um, we have an audience that, and I'm so glad you said you would do something meditative and give us a method. We have an audience that's quite varied. Some of us meditate, some of us don't meditate. Most of us try to meditate a little bit. And um, if you could, in the final moments that we have, uh, actually give us a practical experience. Um, and I know that uh, there was someone who said in the chat, uh, it was Herman who said, I'd love way, he'd love ways to still the mind. Um, and then I'm, I'm sure you'll address that when we do that. But I want to, before we begin any kind of meditative thing, which I'm very excited to, for you to share with us, um, I want to go way back to the first few minutes when you talked about how exhausted you were, too exhausted to perform something for the third time. Mm -hmm. and how you found this. And for the first time in my um, seven, eight years here, I really felt very deeply how I'll speak for myself and maybe for other people in the audience. Um, I've really depended on other things or people to take me out of that exhaustion. And I think they alluded to this last week, we were talking about something totally different here. But um, we know the feeling of being emotionally exhausted. And then all of a sudden that phone rings with good news. Yep. So to take perhaps lifetimes of depending on circumstance, depending on relationship, depending on those crazy thoughts that just come and go. I was just before this listening to Eckhart Tolle talking again about how the mind, that's the mind's job. 
is to just have this chatter. And we define our sense of who we are by that chatter. Ridiculous. And he laughs at him, so he giggles mm -hmm. his way through it, you know. But to be able to take perhaps lifetimes of that habit of depending on things to make me happy or things to make me feel confident and, and have those powers come up. And to ch this is what you are, if I'm getting it correctly, this is the answer Herman wants. This is what you are doing is taking full responsibility, mm -hmm. not depending on any person, any human, just Absolutely. the being. Absolutely. Yeah. So will you do that for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll just mention before, because again, we've come so far from it and I'll give a very short example about it that um, we just have to be very aware. Sometimes we're holding beliefs and ideas that can actually um, become an obstacle to even believing it's possible or to even understanding the processes that make it possible. And just very quick example. I have had at one time, these two clients, they used to come as a duo and, you know, often they'd come in very stressful lives. And there was one day they came in and they were just crazy. It was like, they were almost swinging from the ceiling, you know, with stress, you know, and, and they were lying down to begin their class. And I just had to stop and I said, okay, look, you know, I know you're not really into this, but we're going to meditate because we can't do anything right now. You guys are all over the place. So I very, in a very quick, very short period of time, I just brought their awareness here. I didn't even really talk about the soul, didn't do any of that, just brought their attention here and had them position it there, hold it there, kind of concentrating themselves into this position. That's how powerful this position is. The effect was that when they began to do the movements, I have never seen them. I had never seen them so accurate. Not only that, one of them who's always looking around, looking at her friend, you know, seems to be completely disconnected from her body was actually self-correcting her alignment. I'd never seen that. Next week, they come back. First thing they say to me, you know, that meditation thing we did? I don't want to do it again. It didn't, it didn't, I don't, it didn't do anything for me. And I was like, really? Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Because sometimes there can be a discomfort you know, with things like that. So a little self-awareness, even a knowledge and just how am I feeling about this? How am I connecting it to, to it can be very important. Yeah. Discomfort comes from the differentness. Yes. It, it's disturbing who we think we are. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, and not, it's not, we're not secure in it. You know, sometimes the silence we maybe can, we're gonna go somewhere that might be frightening. You know, because we are used to certain things to allow to give us a sense of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, even to change someone's physical alignment. It's one of the mm -hmm. most difficult things because of the attachment, even when that alignment is the cause of their pain. And they understand that they actually get it. I explained to them, they see it, they get it. They've even experienced shifting it, feeling, and then it's just they're resisting changing that alignment because it feels weird. Mm -hmm. It's not what they're yeah. used to. Yeah. So we want change, but we resist it. <laughs> right. So I am going to ask you if you wouldn't mind before we do the meditation and forgive us if we run a few minutes later today, but I have a few very important announcements that I'd like to make mm -hmm. before we end so beautifully, um, because I need people to know that this Saturday we have two in-person things coming up one Saturday, one Monday evening. And this Saturday, Brother Eric, whom you all know, if you come here every week, he's the voice from heaven up there uh, who keeps us all muted and unmuted. Here he is. And he's going to leave, lead an in-person workshop. And it's only in person. It is not on Zoom. There's his face. 1030 to 11 a.m. If you could enter Harmony House through the bookstore. And he's going to talk about the art of relaxation. And uh, looking forward to that. Again, it will not be on Zoom. But what will be in person and on Zoom is Monday evening, we have a very, very special guest. And as you see, her name is Sister Usha. She's been with the Brahma Kumari since 1974. 
She's currently based in the global headquarters of the Brahma, Brahma Kumaris, and she is a Raja Yoga meditation teacher, but she's so much richer and deeper than just a teacher. She is really not only incorporated in her life, but she's a friend, she's a philosopher. She has studied the Gita and all of these spiritual texts in Hindi. She's written books. She's an incredibly interesting person and uh, someone who has earned many, many awards in her career, peace awards and things. So if you would like to come in person, we're all looking forward to, I know many of you have asked about coming back. Uh, it is hybrid, I will admit. However, if you can come in person, we'd love to just give you great big virtual hugs. And uh, there's a tremendous feeling at Armony House now. Some of you know when you come, there is a, a wonderful eye to eye, the drishti, the contact is different. And you don't have to touch to be touched. It's just wonderful. And I think that's all the announcements I have. And her topic will be knowing and managing the ego. How could I forget Sister Dorothy? Thank you, Brother Eric. Next week, I have the good fortune of emceeing again for Sister Gayatri, whom you've all met. And she's going to talk about the 21 postures of the soul, which Judy Rich illustrated for 21 days. I don't know if she's going to show any of it, but again, she is going to bring together in her unique way, as everyone this month has, how to incorporate mind and body. And it's a beautiful thing. Okay, I'm going to turn it all beautifully over to you. Thank you for coming to us this evening. And let's do it. <laughs> Wonderful. So the idea of this meditation is that we're going to make the, the body no longer a feeling that it's, you know, uh, an obstacle to our spiritual practice, but to make it an ally. And uh, we're going to begin, if possible, if you can have your feet, you know, flat on the ground, and you're going to take your hands and you're going to turn them palms down and just rest them on top of your thighs. And if the chair, if you're sitting in a chair there, or you can have a back to your chair that you can kind of lean against, that would also be great. But, you know, whatever your situation is, we, we work with that. So to begin with, we want to kind of amplify and refine, concentrate the consciousness, because that will be the energy we're using to arrive at a state of yoga. So just resting your hands, your feet on the ground. Of course, for some of us, we might be a bit challenged to have any sensation in the hands or feet, you know, depending on certain conditions we can have, but to whatever degree, I'd like you to start to just direct your attention, your awareness, your consciousness to your hands resting on your legs to the feeling of that touch, knowing that I, the soul, I'm directing my awareness, becoming aware of the sensation of the hands on the thighs. And at the same time as I'm directing my, I'm taking in that experience, the energy of my consciousness is flowing into where I'm directing it into the palms of my hands, my fingers, and even into my legs. And I might experience it as a gentle tingling. Then taking my awareness, adding on to the hands on the thighs, I take it down to my feet, the soles of my feet on the ground, or maybe I'm wearing slippers. <laughs> but I'm aware of that contact again. And as I'm if you will, drinking in the sensation of now the hands, the legs, the feet, the energy of my awareness is also flowing into the hands, the legs, the feet, the fingers and toes. And I might have that experience of energy flowing into those parts of the body. I may also feel from my hands, energy begin to flow into my arms, my forearms. So my awareness is now starting to get a sense of my entire body. And at the same time, I'm sharing the energy of my consciousness with my body. 
It's like I'm giving energy, actively giving that energy to my body as a spiritual being. Just that intention is very powerful. And now I'm taking my awareness. I've got my hands, my feet, my legs, my arms, and I'm adding in my back against the back of the chair. And ideally, if I can, I'd like to feel my shoulder blades are gently in contact with the back of the chair, which will help to open up the front of the body. And as I become aware of my back against the back of the chair, it's then very easy to become aware of the breath moving in my chest, in my belly, a very gentle, rhythmic movement as the body inhales and exhales. And all the while that I'm directing my awareness, the hands, the feet, the legs, the arms, the back, and in that gentle, subtle movement of the breath, I, the conscious living being, through the directing of my attention, my awareness, I am having an impact on the body, energetically. And just doing this practice of directing the awareness is strengthening, is amplifying, and concentrating my consciousness. Just having the intention of directing my attention is concentrating my awareness. So that now as I bring that awareness towards myself, that I know I sit up in the center of the forehead, I'm actually going to first bring my awareness up into my head towards my eyes, towards my seeing, as if I'm looking out through the eye holes of a mask, the mask of my face. My eyes might blink, and I'm gently holding my attention there. And I'm thinking, I am the one seeing through these eyes, I the soul the subtle point of conscious living energy seated in the center of the forehead. I am the one seeing, observing through these eyes. I am the one animating the breath, the body. I am this power. And as I gently but firmly hold my attention in my seeing, it's as if the two physical eyes very naturally center me in the third eye, which is in fact me, the soul. In that space of consciousness that we can call the mind, the place of experience, It's as if I'm gently holding myself there with such lightness, as if my mind has become a hand that is holding my attention between the thumb and index finger of my mind with such lightness, like a pearl. And I'm holding my attention there, knowing that once I'm in this position, this alignment, connected, fully connected and established once again in myself, this spiritual being, I can very naturally tap into that silence, that rich silence, in which joy, love, 
peace, clarity, everything is merged in which I feel so good, so capable, in which I become completely benevolent, pure goodness, because I am fully content in myself as I come into connection again with my own innate capacities, my own inner richness, in that silence and that stillness that gives me such a feeling of stability, mastery, And so we often say it is here that the soul becomes once again seated on the throne, the king, the ruler. And in this pure alignment, positioning, this true state of being, I invoke the presence, the experience, the connection to that spiritual dimension, the feeling of being enveloped in sweet silence and light. Invoking the connection to that ever pure one, the supreme, my spiritual parent, sweet Baba, whose very presence powerfully radiates those qualities of the soul that I've begun to connect to once again. and nourishes my own innate qualities that have almost been starved by lack of attention. And strips away with so much lightness and love all the things the soul has acquired. I begin that cleansing, if you will, of the heart, of the mind, of the being that I am through this union, this yoga, in sweet silence. And I feel the very quality of my being transformed. But I understand that to maintain this, I must be able to maintain this inner alignment and connection as much as possible. And that can only happen through repetitive practice positioning and connecting, positioning and invoking a connection which is in fact eternal to me, but requires that I be fully awake and present as a soul. Let me just take a few more moments to absorb in myself the experience of who I truly am, who is truly mine. And how I become through this awareness and connection.
and then becoming aware of the impact of all of this, transforming my energy that is now radiating, actively radiating into my body, into the breath, and feeling my body becoming so vibrant with that energy, as vibrant as I, the soul, and yet so at ease. Free and full, I fly. Om Shanti. So I'm just, I know it's a little bit late, but um, I'm wondering if Herman got an answer to his question. Herman, are you okay? I don't know if you can unmute. Um, and I'm also wondering if anyone in the audience really experienced for the first time, the silence isn't silent. We had no silence. Um, Tanya was talking the whole time. So where was the silence? The silence was the scrim in the back of the stage, you know? The silence is the absence of the other thoughts and the focus on what Tanya was asking us to do. And I hope you enjoyed the experience, everyone, as much as I did. Tanya, thank you so much for coming to us this evening. Thank Please do come so back. Much for having me. <laughs> yeah. And Om Shanti. Anyone Shanti want to uh, be visible? Thank you, Brother Eric. And give yeah. a wave. You want to un uh, show your can faces? I, yeah. Can I just say one thing? Sure. Oh my God! I just have to say, first of all, how beautiful and powerful that was. In the process. Um, what I have experienced is Pilates separate from what you were sharing and yoga, not the connection with the soul. And having been with Baba for the past seven and a half years, this really came so powerful to me that it was a separation because it was not in unison with the soul, that connection and knowing what to do. It was very separate and the body could not go through that process because the soul was not connected in that. And that was, I just have to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How very powerful that was. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. thank you very much, Tanya. There he is. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. <laughs> uh, some very intense. Mm. But that's very helpful because it will inspire them all to come to Harmony House on Saturday, come back yes. again on Monday, and to be here next week, Thursday, for meditation and silence at 6.30. And we'll all be trying to align ourselves into that automatic, peaceful position of the soul. So Absolutely. thank you very much, Sister Tanya and Louise and everybody. Mm -hmm. Stay well. May you always thank be. You. Thank you. Thank you. Om Shanti. So practice and patience, right? Practice and patience. Yeah. And you will Quick, get there. Yeah. <laughs> Quick reminder Monday evening with Sister Usha begins at 6 30. It's mm -hmm. only an hour, 6 30 to 7 30. So that's the time for that. Thank you, Brother Eric. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you all for coming this evening. See you next week. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Bye-bye.